Hi, it's Dr. Centeno. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, uh, or joining me today here on You've Got the Power. And today we have an interesting topic. The, the focus is going to be on the C1, C2 facet joint capsule and injections there, and whether or not those injections um, can help patients with a CCI, how does that work if so, uh, what are they good for, what are they not so good for, all of that uh, kind of stuff. So, uh, and if you haven't joined us before, you can ask questions uh, about uh, this or anything else by just uh, putting your question in the comments there. And uh, again, if you're just joining us now, we're going to be talking about C1, C2 facet capsular injections and how those work for CCI. Uh, how does all that mechanism look uh, and what kind of things would that be helpful for and what kind of things would that be not so helpful for? So uh, let's start here. I'll go uh, start by sharing my screen and we'll get that going. Looks like that worked. And we'll start talking about C1, C2 facet capsular injections. And it's gonna pen. Okay, so C1, C2 facet capsular injections. Uh, basically the concept here is, uh, as you all probably know, the C1, C2 facet joint is high up in your neck it's responsible for 50% of your head rotation. So it's a pretty important joint. And again, this is high up in the neck over there. And it looks like a very interesting uh, joint because it's got the atlas, which is this ring here. And then it also at C2 has this part called the dens, which sticks up into the atlas. And you can see what it looks like there on the side. And then you can see what it looks like there on the front. Now, these pictures are from uh, my book. And if you haven't read that, uh, go to centenoschultz.com to, to download that because that'll be very helpful in understanding all of this. So C1, C2 instability is called AAI or atlanoaxial instability. Uh, and generally it's the kind of thing that we can see on a digital motion X-ray. Uh, and it shows up in something like this where the corners don't match up and C1 goes out laterally uh, relative to C2. There are normals established for that. In addition, in flexion, you can have the atlantodental interspace open up. And all of that is called C1, C2 instability or atlantoaxial instability. And that's just a subset of the bigger craniocervical instability concept. Now, one concept to help reduce AAI is to inject and tighten the C1, C2 facet capsule. So, the question is, if we're able to inject that capsule, how does that work? Um, what does that work for? What does that not work as well for? All of that good stuff. So I'm going to show you some pictures here, but if we drew a line over here, that would be an example of the C1, C2 facet capsule. And then it's going to sort of come around like this and realize that it's gonna be on the side and it's gonna be in the front and in the back. Now, through posterior injections, the only thing you can really safely reach is the back of that joint, and I'll show you that. So the facet capsule is the fibrous tissue that surrounds that facet joint and determines how much it's gonna move. Now, this particular facet joint moves a lot. It, again, is responsible for 50% of the rotation of your head on your neck. So it's a, uh, a very highly mobile joint. So this facet capsule is going to be a little different than some of the others because uh, it allows so much motion that it's not really going to come into play until you get to the end of the range of motion. And the C1, C2 facet capsule is shown here and shown here. 
and on the side here shown here. Now, as I said, realize that it occurs in the front. There's a part there in the front. It occurs in the side and it occurs in the back. But there's a problem with injecting it on the side. And I'll show you that in a second. But that's the vertebral artery comes right through here and goes up through there and goes up that way into the brain. So the side is not so safe to inject because if you inject that uh, vertebral artery, it's a bad day for everyone. That will cause a brainstem stroke and a posterior circulation stroke. So let's look at how much stability uh, does this facet capsule at C1C2 provide? And there's some cadaver studies we can look at to get some sense of what that is. Now, this is a, an entire book on atlantoaxial instability uh, by Lacey. And it talks about these ligaments kind of in order of how much movement they present. So notice the first one you see here is this cruciate ligament. And that another way to say that is the transverse ligament. Uh, so the part that goes side to side is called the transverse ligament. And uh, that's part of the cruciate ligament. So that's the transverse ligament. And then it gets into the alar ligaments. And then finally, all this other stuff down here. So this one provides uh, the most stability. And, and it's usually put first because if your transverse ligament is busted, that's not consistent with life. You'll have an upper spinal cord injury if it's totally devastated. And then usually this one comes second, uh, but as we've seen, this one can be very important in uh, stabilizing the upper cervical spine and in CCI patients. And then we get into all this other stuff that's up there, and there's a lot, including the facet joint capsules. Uh, so they're kind of putting it in the third position here as far as how much st stability it provides. So this is actually a cadaver model study that was done in the 90s. Uh, and by a guy named Dvorak, Dvorak has published a lot, or at least published a lot in the uh, 1990s, I think he's retired now, uh, about upper cervical spine cadaver studies. So when they cut the facet capsule on the opposite side, now that's cutting it all the way around, not just the back, the only part that can be reached from posterior injections. They got about a one to two degree increase in rotation at C1C2. And then they got a little, maybe one millimeter or less. They, they call it 1.5 degrees, so it's hard to translate, but let's say it's one millimeter or less overhang, not much. Um, but in cadavers where they had already trashed the alar and transverse ligaments, they got much more movement. Uh, so up to three degrees. So still not a lot, but a little bit. So can you inject these capsules? And as I said, uh, you can, uh, but if you're going to inject them from the back, all you can get is this posterior part. And that's only about one third of the facet capsule because there's one third back here. This is the second third. And then there's a, an anterior third. Now, we can get the anterior third through the PICL procedure, but you can't get that with a posterior injection. And it's generally not safe to get the lateral side because the vertebral artery is living right there. And if you inject into that vertebral artery, you can stroke out the patient. Uh, so really, all you're doing is injecting the safe area to inject, which is going to be back here in the posterior part. So only about one third of the facet capsule can be injected from the back. Uh, a second third can be injected from the front if you're doing the PICL procedure. And no one should really go after the side part of the facet capsule because that's an issue. Now, one of the other things that we can get during the PICL procedure and we frequently do, which is not shown here, is the medial part of the facet capsule as well. So realize that injecting the C1C2 facet capsules happens in pretty much every posterior injection we perform. So these facet capsules are injected on the way out of the joint as we're extracting the needle. Um, 
As I said, the side of the C1C2 facet capsule can't be safely injected. The anterior part can be injected as well as the medial part if we're doing the PICL. So the big question I think a lot of people have is if you're just doing posterior C1C2 facet capsules um, and injecting the joint intraarticular, because frequently the joint is injured in those patients. So you also have to document that you're inside the joint. Um, will that fix this kind of patient here? And this is a patient with lots of overhang. Uh, and the answer is not based on our experience. When we used to do posterior injections and require them before PICL, for patients like this, we only had about a one in five success rate uh, for just doing posterior injections. Now, if you add in PICL, that went up to seven in 10. So much, much better for patients like this. But if you've got less severe AAI, this could work. So in summary, the C1-C2 facet capsule does provide some stability to the C1-C2 facet joint complex. Uh, that plays a more minor role in stability than the ALAR and transverse ligaments. Uh, the posterior facet capsule is injected with posterior injection. So if we're, we talk to you about doing posterior injections, uh, that C1-C2 facet capsule, if we're targeting that joint, will be injected. And regrettably, for more severe AAI patients, only about one in five are going to respond to just those posterior injections, and about four in five move on to the PICL plus the posterior facet capsule and the joint. So let me stop the sharing here, and I will go ahead and get to some questions. Uh, Submit advance by uh, Diana Clark. Hi, Dr. Centeno. I'm starting with posterior PRP. How do you determine how far down in the spine to inject? My previous doctor injected in the thoracic area to help stability. You know, uh, Diana, it really depends on what we think is causing problems. So that could certainly be that we uh, go ahead and inject all the way down to the thoracic spine. Uh, in general, with PICL, um, or really any posterior injection in the, for CCI patients, we're doing routinely from nuchal ligament in the skull base all the way down to uh, the T1 area approximately. So that's pretty common, but if you need thoracic injections and you can tolerate that, we will do that area as well. Uh, is fasting for 24 hours prior to PRP draw going to improve quality of the PRP injection? You know, good question. Um, I don't know that we know it's going to improve the quality of a PRP injection. Uh, there is some information on fasting in stem cells that it does seem to improve your stem cells. So uh, listen, I, I don't think it's going to hurt and it could help. Uh, Fatchen, can ligaments atrophy uh, too? We don't normally see ligament atrophy quite as much. We tend to see ligaments go the other direction towards hypertrophy when they get weak. Muscles atrophy when they get weak. Ligaments tend to get bigger and less dense when they get weak. A spin advanced by TT. Hi, if I've suffered from calcaneus AVN, can it be injected with your stem cells for treatment? Uh, it can. A lot will depend on how much of the bone has collapsed at this point. So the answer is it, it can be injected. A spin advanced by KW. Could these methods be used in a turtle? alternative to the fusion of my navicular cuneiform bones. Um, yes, but I'd need to see your, uh, your MRIs and, and hear your history before I could make that determination, but usually yes. Uh, Ulysses, is it possible for muscle spasms pulling on C0 or C1 or C2, and the cervical spine and the shoulder too? Sure, we see that all the time. Um, and we also see the other part of that, which would be shoulder instability causing additional pulling on the neck, which we, in the appropriate patient, will treat both of those. So yeah, it goes back and forth between the neck and the shoulder quite a bit. Uh, it's been advanced by Harry Winston. Does it improve your chances of a good result from a PICL procedure to make sure you keep as active as you can? 
I think it does, um, as long as you're keeping active within the guardrails of not causing yourself to worsen. Um, I think it does uh, make sense to stay active. It's been advanced by DA. Are there supplements that can improve biggest nerve issues? I don't know the answer to that one, so I, I don't want to uh, venture a guess. I think if you were going to look at anything like that, you would look at taking um, anti-inflammatory supplements. So that would be uh, curcumin uh, or with bioparine, um, fish oil. Uh, those would be two good anti-inflammatory ones to consider. Uh, do you know of any providers in Washington that do DMX? I don't know of any providers in Washington offhand. Uh, Carla, and I'll put her information down here, her email. Um, she's my assistant, and she has a list of DMX centers that we have worked with that do a good job. Um, so reach out to her, and she can try to give you some information on that. I just put her email in the comments there. Pia, is there knowledge about, I think, what the distance between the skull and the back of C1 should be? I see a huge difference in patients where some look like too small of a distance. Yeah, Pia, we've seen that as well. I've talked to Dr. Katz about that uh, at length. Um, there isn't a normal right now there. Um, I think what you're talking about is, is in cervical extension. You can see a lot of patients where the skull will hit the back of C1. Um, if it's caused by anything, it's probably caused by the ligaments in the front of uh, the skull, C1 and C2 being lax or damaged. And those are ligaments that we treat routinely when we're in the, uh, for the PICL procedure. How soon do you think you'll start your study for this injecting a swollen burst with a numbing agent? You know, that's a good question, Bethany. We haven't had an opportunity yet to do it. Uh, it would take a patient out here, probably from Colorado, or someone was here in town for a little bit longer so that we could uh, do that and then have a washout period before we did any type of regenerative uh, procedure. So, you know, listen, anyone that wants to come out early, a couple days just to test that out, assuming it's safe in that person, uh, we'd be happy to try that theory. Um, uh, it's basically a numbing injection using a PICL approach, uh, unlike PICL, which takes anywhere from 40 minutes to two hours to do. This is just a quick injection. And um, the goal is to try to see if that swollen bursa is causing pressure headaches. Uh, it probably should cause pressure headaches, but no one's ever tested that theory. Um, the injection would be free of charge since it's part of our own personal investigation. Um, but... Uh, we would need someone out here long and long, long enough to go ahead and do that. Uh, Pia, my son struggles with bilateral Morton's neuroma. Would it be fair to try a steroid injection before doing PRP? I wouldn't inject steroids. Uh, the kind of steroids you're talking about is high dose steroids. So I wouldn't inject high dose steroids for musculoskeletal problems, even though that's common to do. The research is quite clear. It hurts the local tissue and damages it. So no, I don't think it's a good idea to inject uh, a steroid there because steroid based on the existing peer-reviewed randomized controlled trial research is, is harmful to tissues at those doses that would be used uh, by someone injecting around a Morton's neuroma. Uh, Thatchin, what causes flare with physical therapy, spasms or too much C1C2 movement? You know, I think it's the inability to keep C1C2 stable, uh, both from a muscular standpoint and a ligamentous standpoint. So what ends up happening there is that you end up um, getting trauma in the upper cervical spine with physical therapy before those ligaments get tightened down. Now, once the ligaments get tightened down, you can then make a go of trying to strengthen the muscles. Uh, Spit advanced by Kate Wilson. What would be uh, the order to address things if you have lumbar spine issues, knee issues, shoulder issues, and possible CCI? Well, usually CCI first, um, simply because that can overlap with all those other problems and areas. So that that would be my sense is to start with the CCI first and then kind of go from there. Uh, just realize that uh, 
for some patients, we can do all these things at once. Uh, other patients won't tolerate that. So we'll have to, to play that one by ear and take it on a case by case basis. Um, but if we can treat all of those at once, you know, that would be our, our preference. Uh, Bethany, is C1C2 joint, where would you find us where you would find a swollen bursa? Yes, Beth, that's where uh, you would find a swollen bursa in that C1C2 joint. So there's a bursa in front of the dens and between the atlas um, and a bursa behind the dens uh, and uh, right up against that transverse ligament. So they're on either side. And some patients even get fluid above the dens as well. Uh, Andres, a hyaluronic extenno. I read your article. Uh, skeletal stem cells from living growth pits. Let me make this taller. Would be great for you. Yeah, I don't know how to do that, Andres. Um, you know, I, that was a concept, and um, my concern would be that there's no elegant way to do it or no one's really researched it. Now, there is a company out there that is trying to um, use some technology to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, I had a brief discussion with them. I told them I didn't really have any ideas for them. Uh, I think they had read that same article. So maybe it's coming down the pike in the next five to 10 years, but I, I doubt it'll be before that. Anya, can facet block injections help determine if PRP injections will help? If the pain after a block injection doesn't go down, does mean PRP likely won't help either? Well, Anya, a lot of that depends on what, it, what you mean by facet blocks. So if what you mean by facet blocks is a medial branch block, which is where you numb up the nerve on the side, it isn't always predictive of treating the joint with PRP. If what you're talking about put, is putting uh, a toxic high dose of steroid, which is what regrettably is done with intraarticular facet joints injections, that's also hard because that's going to harm the joint. So you'll get a nice inflammatory response, which may be more predictive of PRP injections working. But realize that when we're doing those PRP injections, we're not just injecting the joint; uh, we're also injecting the ligaments. So part of part of it getting better would be helping the joint which maybe the high dose steroid would predict. Um, but the other part that you couldn't predict would be the extra stability uh, component. Michael, uh, can you still receive upper cervical chiropr chiropractic treatment after PICL or is there a waiting time? No, you can go right on back. Uh, if it's well, if it's NUCA or AO, you can go right on back. And in fact, we have a bunch of patients who get to that point of getting their procedure, uh, I would say, well, it's interesting. We just did seven patients with no, no big flare-ups. Um, so that's the way this runs sometimes, right? Sometimes you have one or two in a row. Uh, but where a patient does have a big flare-up of headache after the procedure, the patient uh, will often go back to an AO or a nuclear chiropractor to get relief from that, and it works pretty well. Ed, uh, do we know what percentage of patients who have damage to the ALR transverse ligaments get better on their own through conservative care like bracing temporarily? What difference are the people where it heals versus, versus becomes chronic? You know, Ed, no one's ever really studied that, so I can't tell you that. Um, you know, you kind of get one bite at the healing apple there, and that one bite at the healing apple is going to occur very similar to other ligament um, stretch injuries. So let's say you turn your ankle, right? You turn your ankle, it swells up. You're going to get a couple weeks of uh, healing time there. But certainly by the time you get uh, to six to 12 weeks, that should be healed. Um, and so if you're out three months after an injury and it's still causing problems, then it probably didn't heal with the first bite at that healing apple. Now, you can try to give it a second one if you were to just go into, uh, let's say, a cervical collar. But the cervical collar is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, um, it's going to reduce the stress on the ligaments. But on the other hand, it's going to cause upper cervical muscular atrophy, which is going to wreak more havoc. So I don't know that there's even a way to uh, brace temporarily without harming the patient overall. Um, so you get you get one bite of the healing apple, and if it's not healed after that, you got to start looking at other things. 
Elise, are you the only doctor who has A and S and C? Uh, I think what you're talking about is digital uh, subtraction or DSA, digital subtraction and geography, maybe. Um, uh, DSA wouldn't be common. So let's back up. Let's let's kind of talk about what I think uh, Ulysses is discussing here. So um, on serum fluoroscopy, when you're injecting a joint uh, and you're injecting contrast into that joint, you can see it. Um, now, in order to make sure you're not in the vertebral artery, there's something called digital subtraction and geography. And it's a, it's a computer trick, if you will, that eliminates the background other than the contrast. So if the contrast gets picked up by an artery, you can see it very easily on DSA where you might miss it uh, in looking at all the shadows. So this takes everything out of the background. Um, so who has DSA on their C-arm? Most interventional pain doctors don't because it's a $20,000 add-on and it it's just not used often enough to justify the cost. Um, now, obviously, if you're an interventional radiologist or cardiologist, you live and die by digital subtraction and geography. So you check that box when you bought your C-arm. Um, but I would say 99% of interventional spine doctors or people using C-arms don't have it because they don't see utility for it. And that's because it's only really used if you're injecting at C12 or 01. Now we do that all day, every day. So all of our C-arms have digital subtraction on them. Um, but again, it's not a common thing uh, just because uh, it's expensive and not used very often unless you're doing this work all day, every day. Edward, if CCI becomes a chronic problem, is there any possibility that by taking pressure off the ligaments, they finally get a chance to heal? Yeah, I think that goes back to your last question, Ed. I, I you know, one of the things that I would do more so even than intermittent bracing is to get the curve back, uh, which is that curve restoration stuff we always talk about. Because when your head is like this, you're hanging on those ligaments. But when your head is back and your curve is normal, it's taking pressure off of those ligaments. So if you want to give them a shot at healing for a couple months, restoring that curve is a great way to do that. And we see some patients, and, and that would be a good thing to have Dr. Katz talk about because he's actually treated some subacute patients after car crashes where he's gotten the curve back, and then he's noted that those ligaments have healed. So that's a good thing to try. Now, a lot of our CCI patients can't tolerate that, but if you can, it's a good way to go. Pia, do you think agua cells in the UK can do PRP for Morton's neuroma effectively? Um, sure, I think so, yes. Sure, Michael. Uh, Anya, uh, when a person uh, has spinal instability, EDS, which ligaments are injected in the neck, thoracic and lumbar spine, if the whole spine is unstable? Oh, it depends which ones are unstable. So, um, you know, commonly it would be SI joint ligaments, supraspinous, interspinous ligaments, intertransverse ligaments. Those are some of the ligaments that would be injected in someone who had spinal mobility or sorry, hypermobility in multiple parts of the spine. Delicia, is there, uh, there, there a research paper or is there a research paper out there saying people who is on, are on their phone for to have partial ligaments laxity slow? No, no, I don't think there's anything out there, but I, I do think that that's an important point. And that is what we tend to see is, you know, not so much that, but we see this all day, right? We're all looking at our phones checking our phones, and that's putting a lot of pressure on those upper cervical ligaments. Um, it's also causing the spine to change shape over time. And that's not a healthy thing for our kids or for us uh, when we're doing it. Some advanced by TT, what is the average amount of time it takes for a PICL procedure to heal enough to be back to pre-PICL -pre procedure level activity? Um, well, as I always say, that depends on where we start, right? We had uh, a patient this week who um, wasn't really spending more than 15 minutes upright, and now she's up to two hours upright, which is great, right? But that's nowhere near normal. Now she just got her second procedure, and hopefully we can get her further down that road. That's quite different from another patient we had this week who was working out, um, 
had to modify things a lot. Um, so he'll probably make a complete recovery. Uh, so you see the difference there, right? There's vast differences in how much disability patients have accumulated based on the severity of their injury, the time uh, between when they got injured and the problem was detected, et cetera, et cetera. How common are odontoid fractures with traumatic lenoaxial instability? Um, well, in this patient population, not common, but if we look at Atleno uh, or, or AAI or CCI, as it's diagnosed in the emergency room after like a big car crash, you're going to see odontoid fractures in that type of situation. But in this patient population, not very common. Stephen, if a person has CCI from an accident or a ligament overstretching, is it easier for the stem cells like EDS? Um, we didn't see a big difference. Uh, uh, Stephen, I just did this probably two weeks ago. There's a video on that data set looking at EDS versus non-EDS. And we didn't see a big difference between those data sets. Now, at the end of the day, uh, my personal opinion is that uh, it takes longer for those EDS patients to heal and perhaps more treatments. But if you look at you know, where people are after, on average, about two treatments, there isn't a big difference between EDS and normal ligament patients. Uh, I know this is a, uh, a weekend where we are kind of in the uh, MLK zone, um, meaning a three-day weekend. So is uh, any other questions that any, anyone has out there? Um, looks like we've got a lot of people on, but uh, just go ahead and type your questions below in the comment section of whichever app you're on, and I will try to answer those uh, questions. Here we go. Uh, uh, John Hank, can you look at DMX in an online consultation? Yep, we do that all the time. I did that with four patients this morning, although one, one patient regrettably had to deal with my computer kind of going on the fritz, so I had to change desktop computers here. Uh, Jennifer, my AO chiropractor suggested I try 1.5x the recommended dose of glucosamine chondroitin with MSM for my neck pain. It seems like it might be helping. I had an uncommonly good week. Does it tell you anything about might be going on? Um, not so much because glucosamine and chondroitin are pretty good anti-inflammatory drugs and or drugs for arthritis. So what it may tell us is you've got some arthritic type inflammation and that's helping that arthritic type inflammation. So that's a great thing. I mean, anytime that you can take a dietary supplement and get good results is great, right? You don't have to take narcotics, you don't have to take all those other crazy drugs. You can just stay on something natural. So I think that's that's wonderful. Um, and I never know how to say this one. Um, are there any hard neck braces you would recommend, any fractures to look for, or features to look for, sorry. Um, you know, Miami J is sort of the classic hard neck brace and you can find those on Amazon. But I think what I'd recommend uh, when, in this topic with patients is to go on Amazon and find a good hard uh, neck collar. So let's say a Mi Miami J collar that's relatively inexpensive. Uh, let's say it's 20 bucks. Order it, you get it, you put it on, uh, and then cut it up. And what I mean by cut it up is that it's either going to work out of the box or you're going to say, yeah, that feels great. Obviously, don't use it too much because we've just talked about that. Or it's not. And if it's not, that would be the time to start cutting it up and making modifications. Take a little out of here. Take a little out of there. See if you can modify it in order to make it fit you in the right position. And if that doesn't work, order a different kind and do the same thing. Um, and in that way, you can probably find some neck brace that you could use for travel and other things where you're not using it every day, but you're used, just using it when you're putting your neck under stress. Uh, WW Soft, uh, has any research been done on the effects of silicon or glycine on patient outcome strength? Not that I know of. I wouldn't imagine that that would make a big difference, but not that I know of. 
Uh, Dory, is it still possible to have your procedures if you refused occipital to T2? I mean, uh, not PICL, it's not going to make a difference. Um, so that ship got has sailed. Um, now, there may be issues that could be treated, like uh, the joints uh, that still may be painful at certain levels, uh, that could be treated, or uh, below the fusion, T2-3, that could be treated, but certainly not what we're talking about here with regard to craniocervical instability. Roger, how often and, and after how much time do people return for a PICL after initially successful set of PICLs? Um, we generally don't see people come back at this point once they've reached that steady state. Um, and let's see, we are how many years out? So we're eight years as of this year. So I think we're starting to get enough, enough time on this to know that if a patient got into that uh, category where they were feeling much, much better, they're usually not regressing once we're done. Regenis, or ah, submitted by Regenix and Sherry Kopp. Sorry about that. What's involved in treating SI joint pain? It got really bad after my second child. Yeah, that one's pretty easy to treat. That is uh, treating the SI joint ligaments, sometimes the symphysis pubis up front. And, you know, that's an example I give a lot where it actually goes to the number of procedures. Um, so for prolotherapy, for women, for SI joint pain uh, and instability, we're talking six to eight. For PRP, you can half that, so three to four sessions. And for bone marrow concentrate, you can half that, usually one to two sessions. So that gives you some idea of the strength of each one of those treatments and treating that kind of problem. John, is it possible to measure ADI and MRI or need x-rays? Um, you can measure ADI and MRI, but it's a little, it's not quite as clean because sometimes it's difficult at that resolution of those small structures to differentiate where the bone begins and ends and the soft tissues begin and end. So it's easier to do on something like a DMX or a flexion x-ray. Uh, Roger, I have a disc bulge at 5'6". I'm pinching a nerve down the right arm. What can be done? Um, yeah, Roger, we treat those all the time. I've got one as well, um, so I'm right there with you. Uh, mine flared up really bad maybe four or five years ago. We treated it with platelet-based injections around the nerve, tightened down the ligaments. I do pretty much what I want at this point. Uh, so that's how that uh, gets treated without surgery. Dory, the most important part of the hard collar is fit. Um, yeah, I would agree, Dory. I see that a lot. I see people trying a hard collar once. They're like, it doesn't fit. But I think as what you're bringing up is correct. You have to get one that's got some adjustment to it. And then you may need to modify it. Get out a pair of scissors and cut this or cut that to make it fit you. Because a lot of them don't come out of the box fitting real well for any particular person. Jeanette, can you advise the name of a recommended ARO Nucodoc local to you for patients to see post PICL? Yep, we have uh, two different um, AO docs that we use who are really, really good. Uh, if you just contact Carla and her information is there, she can uh, get you those names. Johnny, uh, how well can you elevate integrity of the accessory atlanto-occipital ligament from an, or evaluate integrity from an upright MRI? Seen some literature describing characteristics in 3T, but not upright. Yeah, the big problem with all upright MRIs is you're going to, going to sacrifice a lot of detail for the ability to get that upright imaging. So compared to a 3T, for example, you're probably at one-sixth the detail or 15% of the detail of a 3T on an upright MRI. And the accessory ligament is never easy to see so uh, it might be very hard to see on an upright MRI where it'd be much easier to see on a 3T MRI. Rosalind, uh, thank you for your presentation. Are there any supplements you can recommend for the poor cognition many of us have? Um, you know, only just those anti-inflammatory supplements. So we were talking about some before, glucosamine, chondroitin, uh, MSM, uh, fish oil, meaning high-dose uh, EPA fish oil, 
uh, curcumin with bioparine. Those are the kind of things I would use for that kind of problem uh, if it were me. Lissy, how long have you been doing these injections for years? Well, for PICL since 2015, uh, treating upper cervical patients with injections almost my entire career. So I started working as a doctor in private practice in 1993. Hard to believe. So that makes me 30 years in private practice. So I think I started doing injection work on this patient population, maybe six months to a year into that. So for 29 years, been treating this patient population. Um, but for PICL, we didn't start that till 2015. Shows you I'm getting to be a very old guy. Hard to believe I've been in private practice for 30 years. And then obviously uh, years and years of training before that, uh, residency, internship, medical school, all that good stuff. WWSOFT, does the standard of care develop your clinic professional organizations apply to other medical professionals who might be associated? Not sure what you mean there. Standard of care for what specifically? That would be helpful to know. Uh, Kimberly, uh, I've asked before about shockwave for CC. I understand it doesn't directly get to the ligaments, but I have done a total of three so far, posterior, uh, CCI injections seem to be helping overall posterior neck pain. Um, could this be helping as an adjunct with secondary OPLL and confirmation? Yeah, listen, I think as I said before, um, the nice part about shockwave is that it could uh, treat some of the more superficial pain that patients tend to get along the skull base and at the back of C2 where a lot of those muscles attach or the spinous process to C2. So listen, if it's helping, that's wonderful. Do I think it's going to treat uh, CCI? No, it's just not gonna get anywhere near those ligaments. Um, but if it's helping some of that more superficial pain, that's, that's wonderful. Pia, can hand tremors in the thumb come from upper neck C1, C2? Um, it's possible. Um, that would normally be C5, 6 that would go there, but it's possible. Uh, we certainly have seen people get numbness and tingling in the arm and hands just with CCI alone. Hand tremors would be a less common thing seen, and I'd probably need to take a look at the tremor to get a better idea uh, of what we're talking about there. Uh, Dory, uh, and that one's not complete, but I've, maybe it's to... Insurance companies pay for this kind of stuff. Um, uh, insurance companies know. Now, Regenix, uh, which is the company I founded and, and, and the medical director of still, um, has about 700 companies that pay for all this stuff. Uh, but those are direct contracts with those companies. Uh, so that's how that would work. If there was insurance coverage, you'd have to check to see if you were with one of those companies to get this kind of thing covered. If you're not, then there wouldn't be any general health insurance coverage. Lissy, is it, is it impossible for neck to go hyperlordosis so much? Uh, we certainly see Ulysses, uh, Ulysses, uh, patients with a hyperlordosis or a, a super high curve. Um, so not impossible, but there's certainly going, there's certainly gonna be the facet joint contact in the posterior facets there. Uh, that are going to stop things from going any further. The other thing that would stop things from going any further is the anterior and longitudinal ligament up front. Uh, Dory, are any of these procedures covered with medical insurance now? Just answered that one. Uh, John, how many more years will you offer PICL? I'm needing to save money. Oh, how many more years am I going to practice? 10 maybe, something like that. I mean, I'm, well, maybe not that many, five or six five to 10, who knows? I don't really have that answer yet. Um, I can tell you that this is the first year I started to take more extended time off. So uh, I'm taking two six week periods off this year. And uh, that's because I've been running hard, hard since I've been a young man. So, um, but uh, shouldn't be a problem. The, there'll be someone doing this procedure, whether it's me, um, uh, my partner, Dr. Schultz, or uh, one of the younger doctors in the clinic that will take it over. But we'll always have someone doing it um, uh, going forward. 
Jennifer, I finally got an MRI and have gluteal tendinosis in my left hip. Been in a, I've been in workers' comp limbo for over a year now. They have effectively kept me from getting medical care. Are there any studies you can point to the shoulder injury treatment to help? Um, tendinosis, gluteal tendinosis uh, can be helped with PRP. Are there any specific PRP studies on gluteal tendinosis? That's a good, good question. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Oh, uh, well, I had to change computers. It's always frustrating when they don't have Google as the default. Because I'm getting commercial results and not scientific results here. So hold on a second here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there's a couple, I guess. Um, yeah, I'll put the, uh, here's a randomized controlled trial of PRP for that diagnosis. And I will put the, uh, the link uh, into the comments here. So just click the link. It'll take you there. Send that to your worker's comp carrier. Uh, can the styloids affect success of these procedures? Not usually, no. Uh, just realize that when we're talking about any kind of styloids causing compression. Uh, in this patient population, that compression is being caused by instability. So you want to get rid of the instability first, because once you cut the hyoids, um, that's going to cause anterior instability. So you don't want to do that unless you have to do that. Oh, uh, it did not like me putting a link here. It may have something. Oh, no, I guess it came through. Looks like it came through. So let me know if the link is there. Uh, that's the link for that study. Melissa, well, is okay to get cervical posterior PRP treatment for PICL? Sure. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of part of the topic today, right? Um, we can always try posterior PRP first. If you've got more severe instability, it tends not to work so well or be all that successful, but there's no reason not to try it. Um, so absolutely. Sure, Jennifer, hopefully that works with the, the, the workers' comp gods that decide that kind of thing. Great. Um, Okay, so we're coming up on our last 10 minutes. Any other questions I can answer that anyone has out there? I know we're just entering into the MLK three-day weekend, um, but any, any questions I can answer that anyone's got? Uh, either on today's topic, which was C1C2 facet capsule injections or anything else. Okay, guys, we'll start to wrap this up. And if there's any other questions that come in while I'm wrapping it up, I can get to those. So listen, at the end of the day, this was about um, C1, C2 facet capsular injections and treating uh, CCI. Here's some more questions. Uh, can instability be lethal? Um, not the kind of instability we're talking about. Um, so the answer is in general, no. Now, if we're talking about Upper cervical fractures, like Hangman's fractures, fractures of the dens, that can be lethal. Um, but in this patient population, no, we're not talking about it being uh, lethal or having a high likelihood of being lethal. Happy to help, Pia. Uh, WJH, if you have instability in both the lumbar, grade two anterothesis, bulging disc, and cervical spine, is it best to stabilize lumbar spine first. Yeah, so if there's a grade two spondylosthesis in the lumbar spine, that's going to be a harder one for regenerative medicine to treat. Um, so that might require a surgical fusion. Uh, so, uh, you know, normally we can treat somewhere in that grade one range, but by the time you get to grade two, uh, even though it doesn't sound like a lot, grade two, it's a lot. 
uh, meaning that you're generally further forward on one vertebra than the other, than the width of the entire foramen, which is where the nerve comes out. Uh, Magda, is it possible to heal hip labral tears with PRP or stem cell injections? Treat them all the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, we treat patients with hip labral tears very commonly. It works well. They avoid surgeries, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's one we treat a lot and it works well. Uh, WW soft can instability cause nerve degeneration. Does nerve degeneration tend to reverse itself after treatment? Uh, let's say nerve injury. And, and in the, I think we've had this discussion a couple times before um, as a group. And that is if we look at this kind of thing, right, there's the instability and then it's causing some small amount of damage over time and time plus small amounts of damage equals more damage. And so uh, there are patients in this patient population that, that morph from just nerve irritation to nerve damage. And if you let it get to the nerve damage phase, um, that can be a problem because now it's much, much harder to treat. So nerve irritation, we can treat all day long and twice on Sunday. Uh, scarring around nerves, we can treat because we can hydrodissect and break up the scarring using very precise ultrasound guided injections. But nerve death is much harder to treat. Um, so that's why you don't want to push this into that mode where nerves starting to or start to get irreversibly damaged. Uh, Ulysses, why every doctor keeps saying bulging disc cause the pain when they forgot the other structures? You know, there's a good story behind that one, Ulysses. I'll, I'll tell you the story here briefly. So um, uh, prior to uh, a prior to the 1940s, as we were just starting to figure out x-rays and lumbar spine, um, uh, actually treating the ligaments in the spine with a prolotherapy type solution back then, it was a drug called Sanusol, was a big deal. It was usually how most family doctors would treat the back if they had any knowledge of how to treat the back, which wasn't a lot of them. Um, and then Mixter and Barr um, published their seminal paper on how disc herniations could cause sciatica and paralysis in the leg. And from that moment on, as the surgeon started to figure out how to, through the 50s, how to go in there and take out the disc herniation, the focus changed from everything else that was causing pain to the disc. And that was really a function of the surgeons focusing on the disc. So everything else kind of went passe. And it wasn't really until the 90s and early 2000s that interventional spine doctors started to become a thing where we started to say, hey, the facet joint also can hurt and uh, the nerve itself can be cause pain and the disc itself can cause pain outside of a disc bulge or herniation. Um, and then, you know, things started to reverse and our disc fetish, as I called it, uh, or I have called it before, started to get more balanced. Um, looking at other parts of the functional spinal unit. And then as regenerative medicine came in, it kind of went full circle. And we started to look at all of those different things, not just the disc bulge itself. Uh, Dory, I'm not quite sure what that um, connects to. So I don't know how to answer that one. Uh, Pia, sorry, back to the theme, Morton's, which structures should be treated? Um, so if it's a Morton's neuroma, that's going to be uh, a digital nerve problem between the, uh, the bones there of the foot. And so it's possible that a bone can be pressing on the area. So that could need to be treated, or it's possible that it's just nerve irritation, or it's possible it has nothing to do with that. It's coming from the spine. We see that all the time. So someone who knows how to look at that, and algal cells would be great for that, needs to take a look and, and sort that out. WJH, to follow up on my previous question, so would you relay, delay cervical treatment until the lumbar spine is stable? Um, not usually. Many times, oh, actually, sorry, you're going back to the grade two spondylolisthesis. Um, um, 
Yeah, probably if it's causing you a lot of pain, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Now, if you have CCI, it might be a different story. That would take precedence. But if we're just talking about neck pain to disc bulges, then I'd get the back fix first. Uh, where do you publish research? All over the place. Uh, let's see, John, see if I can share my screen here. So if you go to... Genex site and go to physician resources, published research. Let me see if I can get that going here. So this is where, well, we publish our research all over the place, lots of different journals. Uh, this is where I index my regenerative medicine research. Now, I've got probably three dozen papers outside of this that have nothing to do with regenerative medicine, but usually that's what people want to hear about. Um, so these are all of our, all of the different studies I've published through the years on this particular topic. Um, so. I've got more research published in regenerative medicine than probably 99% of the academics who are working in this space right now, just because I was the first person on earth to do many of these procedures. And I was publishing on those rather than just doing it and saying this, this kind of works or that kind of works. Um, so that's where all of our stuff lives. So we can stop that. Um, okay, uh, Dory, sorry, L4-5 causing one calf to go numb. So listen, Dory, it sounds like you've had some big research to date, so I don't know that I would repeat that. Um, uh, definitely look at non-surgical options, and this is a, a very viable option for what you're describing. Um, now, if you've got grade two spondylolisthesis, as I just said, this may not be the best thing for you because that's pretty severe and that may require a lumbar fusion. Um, oh, the link to that. Let's see if I get rid of it. Sure. Let's see. Here we go. There we go. Um, and then there's also other research studies on PubMed that have nothing to do with regenerative medicine. So they're probably not indexed there, but that'll get you a good chunk. Um, okay, I'm going to take the last few questions because I'm going to go till two o'clock today, my time. Uh, so that's just a couple more minutes. Delissi, how do people get spinalis thesis again? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Ulissi, meaning they got it cured and it came back. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, okay, guys, well, I'm going to start wrapping this up. Uh, uh, WWSoft. <coughs> Why do some doctors not bother with publishing? Uh, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy. Uh, just so you have a sense of how much time it takes. Um, so I don't know how many papers I just showed you, 40 or something that I've published. I mean, each one of those papers takes a team of three to five people um, somewhere. And I'm not talking about just collecting the data, that's separate, but just to write it up and get it published and go through that process takes dozens of hours of man hours to uh, put all that, do all the statistical analysis, put all that stuff in a, in a certain form, send it off to the journal, deal with their reviewers back and forth, asking this question and that question. So it takes a lot of time. Um, and normally you're incented to do that if you're in, a, in, in the ivory tower in an academic setting and you're disincentivized uh, for doing it if you're in private practice um, because you don't have the infrastructure. Now, many years ago, I spent the money to develop that infrastructure. Um, so we were able to get that done, but that's money that came out of my pocket. It didn't, it wasn't mystery money that came from the government. It wasn't magic money that flew from the sky. It was my money. Uh, so instead of buying something new or doing this or doing that, that money went into research. Um, so that's why it doesn't get done. Okay, guys, thanks so much for watching. I want you to have a wonderful three-day weekend. I don't think, 
I don't think I'm working on Monday. Uh, I'll have to check. Um, I'll probably be catching up on some things. So I'm probably not going to do a Facebook Live, but, but I may. So <laughs> I'd love to tell you yes or no, but we'll see how things go. Um, and uh, I want to thank you for your wonderful questions today and your curiosity. And again, as I always uh, say on this particular show, it's so critical that patients understand these things uh, because really there's so much to learn to get the highest quality healthcare out of our healthcare system. So have a wonderful uh, three-day weekend and I may or may not be here on Monday. I'll let you know. Thank you so much.